Now, we touched on the topic of low code a little bit earlier. Let's go a bit deeper now and talk about harnessing the power of low code with Gen AI, transforming business innovation and development with, he's so keen to be here, he's already up here on the stage, <laughs> the regional VP ANZ for OutSystems. This is Paul Arthur. Thanks for joining us. Paul, how are you going? I'm good. Thanks, Adam. Appreciate it. Low code, I love it. I can remember a few years ago when we first started talking low code at events and people's eyes would sort of roll back in their head and all that. Are we there yet? Do people really get low code or is it still in a sort of early stage where you need to be fairly evangelical just about even the concept? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And first of all, I was really surprised to get a low code shout out from Mark yeah, and, nice. and Lassian. That was great uh, to hear that, that at least they understand and he's obviously aware of what it is. But yeah, I agree. I think it's still at a situation where people, not that they don't and don't get or don't know what low code is, but there is a perception. They have a perception of what low code is and what it may have been when it was first sort of um, come into fruition about 10 years ago. I mean, our systems as a company is 20 years old. Our first platform was, was built 20 years ago. And about 10 years ago, it was placed by Gartner into this magical concept called low code. And I think it's probably the worst thing that ever happened to our technology because people then started to consider the word low as something that is of low value or low power, a low use case mm. cover. What, what does the like, low in low code, as good or bad a descriptor as it is, what does it mean? What does it go to the heart of? It really means that you don't need to create every single line of code when you're building your applications and building your business services. You can still do that, and you can still embed code within the platform and use it, but you could also build applications without even writing a single line of code because you're using a visual interface that effectively, like an early version of a Gen AI, is going away and building that code behind the scenes and running it from within the platform. Okay, let's drill down now into the whole idea of customer experience because mm. it's been a passion of yours for a long time. You've got a strong background in technology as a driver of mm. customer experience. In the next few years, in the window of, say, three to five years, what, what are the next big things that are coming? Yeah, I think uh, it's always difficult to do too much of a projection. You know, if we'd have sat here three years ago and mm. had that same question, we'd all been talking about um, blockchain yep. and quantum computing. The right? metaverse. And what exactly. The metaverse. And where have those, those all things gone? So, but I think what we are seeing is a combination now where people are starting to look at much more of the concept of a composable enterprise where you can take bits and pieces from different technology streams to create a more of a focus on what we're delivering to the customer. So doing an outside in architecture rather than an inside out architecture. So when we talk about low code and we talk about Gen AI and we talk about how we deliver applications and customer experiences, we're now seeing people starting with what the outcome needs to be and then putting the pieces together behind the scenes that align with that, as opposed to in the past, we were very much caught up in a model where what can the technology do and then how do we work within the boundaries of that technology to provide a solution out for our end user customers? Okay, give us an example, either in Australia or abroad, of a company who's really getting it right with low code and Gen AI around CX. Give us an example of something that really impresses you? I think some of the, there's two companies across Asia, and then I'll come back into more of an ANZ right. model, but across Asia, two really strong companies who we're working with. One is Toyota. So Toyota Motor Group are literally using both of those two technologies, both internally and externally, to navigate the size of a business that are that big and be able to bring together different insights, but in terms of the way that their concept understands. Toyota is a company, obviously mission critical customer focus in everything they do from a manufacturing and motor vehicle perspective, but they're doing the same thing with their technology. And another one is Petronas, the major oil company in Malaysia. They had a strategy around citizen developer. They wanted to put the power of innovation in the hands of their customers. Um, they started off with a different technology. They've now pivoted and are doing it without systems. But what their view is, we want the people on the front line telling us, and not just telling us what they want, but actually showing us and being able to build what they want. But closer to home, a really interesting example, and when I say closer to home, I mean really close to home, an organisation we're working with right now is Victoria Police. Mm -hmm. We're working with Dr. Stephen Hodgkinson at Victoria Police around some really exciting use cases. I can't go into the details of them, but they have a mindset that everything is about supporting the community and the officers behind their seat. So everything that they're building right now, and we're working with them, is to build fast and to iterate fast based on the requirements of the community and the officers out in the field. And they're pulling together different components from different technologies, but all with a maniacal focus on agility and innovation 
rather than a focus on technology. And that's a really exciting use case right here in Melbourne. You've got that agility, you've got that speed piece. What are the other direct business benefits if you really harness the full potential of low code? When you really start uh, uh, leveraging low code, you really start talking about creating a flywheel effect of innovation. So organizations can take solutions to market faster. And when you see success, what does that create? It creates more success. So more parts of the business in the past may have been told, oh, you can't do that. We're not, you know, we're not be able to do that. We can't provide that technology. As they start to see these services being provided, then more ideas come. So more innovation starts to be driven. The other thing we also do is it allows people to focus in what they're actually here to do and provide solutions for their business. Because the power of a low-code platform is that it supplies that underlying infrastructure technology for you. It takes care of the scalability, the performance, the security of the platform, and allows you to just focus on the application and how that application is going to help your business, be it more efficient, drive more revenue, create less risk in your business. You can actually double down the resources on the value, business value add side, as opposed to take resources away potentially from the mundane day-to-day -day site reliability, DevOps, security function, because that's already baked into the low-code platform. That's what you pay us to do from that perspective. Okay, so given that it's even sometimes there's messaging still needed to the, you know, the frontline tech people about low-code, if, if you've got a client who at that level is keen, mm. how do they sell it to the board? How do, they, how do they get the conversation going with the CEO? What sort of things do they stress in those conversations as the essential benefits that will tilt the needle in favour of people going for loco. It's funny because it's actually often the, the other way around. It's often the board and the CEO see the business value of adopting low code. They actually say, yeah, well, why, we're not a tech company. We're not an IT organization. Why do I employ all these security people? Why do I employ all these DevOps people? Why do I employ all these site reliability? Why am I paying Oracle for database? Why am I paying Microsoft for this? I don't understand that. We're a bank. We're a, we're a retailer. We're a whatever. So the board get the concept of saying, we can take all that away from you and allow you to focus on your business and your solutions. Our challenge is then when we come back to the technology specialists, who may have years of experience but in building of doing things a certain way in a very monolithic or hierarchical structure that they don't perceive that our loco platform can provide all of those things to the level that they require. And we have customers doing you know, highly advanced, highly secure workflows, millions of transactions a second, um, and we can prove it to them if we can, but often the challenge is not selling it to the business, it's selling it to the technology people. Okay, well let's let, yeah, let's say the CEO has been convinced. How, how, how do you get teams to actually take this up? What are the challenges, the concrete steps that need to be taken to start really implementing low code? The first thing obviously is to find the right use case. You've got to find the right use case, one that's important to the business, one that has no point trying to start with a low-code platform for some small, minor portal in the corner that no one really is going to care about, because you know what? Anyone can do that. Mm -hmm. So when we talk to organizations and people say they're starting to look and develop, uh, want to develop a low-code solution, we say, give us your most important use case. What's the problem you're trying to solve? What's the most important to you as a business? Once you find that right use case, then you can build very quickly, start to build pilot solutions. Uh, and start to iterate, because no version one of anything is any good. But people tend to spend a lot of time trying to create the perfect version one. Low-code platform's about iteration. It's about creating a MVP solution that you can then take out. And when I say MVP, we don't mean most viable product. We mean most valuable product minimum valuable product, something that actually adds value, and then iterate that based on the feedback that you get from your clients and the feedback that you're getting from your end users and all your testing, your user acceptance testing, and then accelerate those changes through that mechanism, because that's the right agile approach for low code. And what we're seeing is the same things happening with Gen AI. What we're now seeing is that Gen AI is, everyone's excited about it, but everyone's also a bit scared about it. What we're working with our systems is how do we bring Gen AI into the low-code platform so you get the power of the governance and the control of the low-code platform fired up with the power of the AI engine that can then also provide those level of insights. In, in terms of the different sorts of use cases you might want to apply to as your, as your first one, are there some typical sort of silos of use cases where this stuff tends to work better, especially if it's the first thing 
a team's tried to roll it out on? And it's normally the one that's most scary for most organisations, <laughs> but it is customer facing. Okay. Anything customer facing, our systems provides a, a fantastic solution. And, and most of the local platform do, but our systems specifically, obviously around, <laughs> the, uh, around providing something that allows you to iterate very fast and providing a custom version of the, of the assets. We, yes, you can do workflow and you can do all those different back office solutions as well, but there's a lots of off the shelf solutions. And, and what I'm saying is, I'm not saying you should use a loco platform for everything. Mm -hmm. right? What we're saying is if there is an off the shelf solution that is perfect for your needs, go buy the off the shelf solution. That's fine, just there. But there probably won't be because you're probably going to have to do some form of configuration to your off the shelf solution. Uh, loco platforms are the perfect mix between build and buy. Buy is an <coughs> off the shelf solution, but you often still have to customize it. Build, often you're starting from scratch, you're building the foundation, the security, the scalability, that's a pain. Whereas with a low-code platform, you're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting something that's already built, but you're also getting something that you can configure. Let me ask you a sort of existential question mm -hmm. about the concept of coding. So we've got here, low-code takes yep. away the need to be able to write every single line of code. You can still go in and yep. write some solid code behind it. Some people are arguing with Gen AI, which is now writing its own code. Old Jensen from NVIDIA yeah. a few months ago got a lot of heat for saying, in five years, you'll be wasting your time teaching anyone to code because <laughs> the algorithms will just write the code themselves. What is the future of coding as a thing? Does the move to low code, is it another step in the direction of us just not needing people who can code anymore? Does it... Augment, where's, where, where's it's, coding it's, going? It's augmentation. It's in the, I take it same back to the, same, to the building industry. You know, when we started to, if you want to build a house today, you want to put the wooden frame up, then yes, in the old days, someone came along, a carpenter came with hammer and nails, and he hammered in every nail, and he put it up, and he measured, and he put it all together. Now, someone comes along with a nail gun and goes, doo, 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 all the way around, and all of a sudden, your frame's up. Are there any less builders than there were back then? No, there are more efficient builders or they're builders with different skills. The same thing's going to happen with coding. You're going to find that the run-of-the-mill coding, the building out of architectures and databases and servers and that sort of stuff's going to go away. But the coders will then be focused on the differentiation, the code that makes a difference to the business, not just the code that makes technology work. Okay, and a bit further up the tree, the bosses of the coders, the tech chiefs, you've worked with so many people across a range of industries. The best of the best, what do they tend to do? What are the standout skills of the people who excel in that tech chief space? Yeah, they're curious. They're curious. They don't just sit on their laurels and say, this is how I do things. This is the way we work. They're going out. When we first started talking to say, Vic Police, Dr. Stephen, you know, the conversations we had with him were very much like, I don't just want an application. I want a whole new way of doing things. And he talked about becoming more agile and more innovative. That vision and having that vision and then being able to bring your organisation on that vision is what makes a standout technology leader as opposed to just a delivery technology leader. If you didn't get along to our systems during the course of the day or lunch, make sure you come along during our networking event at the end of the day. So hello to Paul and the team. Thanks so much, Paul. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Paul from our systems. Okay. Yeah.